Welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. I am joined by a hero, a legend, one of my good friends, Pastor Rob McCoy. And we're here in Miami, Florida. It's a new year. 2022. Amen. And last night was epic. Sean. Last night oh, was gosh. so fun. We were worshiping here in Miami. Had the governor with I us. I still got chills from last night. It was so <laughs> good. So good. And uh, yeah, the governor was here. The governor was here. It was amazing. America's governor. America's governor. And uh, today we are going to hear from Pastor Rob. And I just want to say this. This is so special for me because uh, when we felt the call to you know, when I felt the call to run for U.S. Congress, which is crazy in California, you know, there was two guys that right as we came out of the gate stood behind us. And one of them was Governor Mike Huckabee. Love that man. Uh, just was like, I'm all in. Sent me, a, sent me a, a, a check right away and said, I'm behind you, whatever you need. And the other one was Pastor Rob McCoy. And so I just, without these two guys, like it was confirmation from the Lord, I we wouldn't have been able to, to do any of it. And so I'm just so grateful for you and your family and your church. And I'm excited to, I want everybody to hear your story, like yeah. and how you've become who you are. And you have such a voice into, not only into the nation, but into the political realm, into how churches engage. You've been fighting, of course, it, against the mandates in California. You've stood strong. And really has been a model. You've been a model church and a leader for our nation. So, thank you for coming on. Uh, well, all, all the the kind things you said about me, Sean. I feel that way about you. <laughs> I always say I'm I'm rubber. Your glue bounces off me, sticks to you. I I'm I'm moved. I, I didn't understand the worship community. Yeah. Um, I always kind of looked at Christian worship as uh, secular music uh, with you know, a, a Christian tagline. Right. And and I I got burned out early on as a youth pastor because I'd start getting all the requests that these bands needed uh, right. before they'd come and the writers and everything. And I, I just, I'd had enough of it. Yeah. It wasn't wow. until I met you and saw your heart and, and a handful of other right. worship leaders um, putting it all on the line. And, and it, it's not about money. Yeah. I'm blessed by you. you you've restored you. my heart towards music that, that moves my heart. I'm, I'm <laughs> Thank blessed you. By you. Thank you, man. Yeah. That's amazing. So, uh, story? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, you're a pastor. <laughs> you were a mayor of your city. Um, and this has been a really heightened era where, you know, me and my wife were laughing about this. Like, before COVID, like, nobody even knew who their governor was. No. Nobody had a clue. <laughs> nobody knew who their mayor was. Nobody knew. And all of a sudden, now, everybody knows because they're finding out what they can do with their life. Yeah. Based upon what their uh, leaders say. So what was the journey that got you into politics? When did that happen? Tell us a little bit about that. So I wasn't raised in a, a Christian home. I don't remember going to church with my family. Okay. I don't remember praying or reading the Bible with my family. Um, but I do remember being politically active. My mother was president of the Republican Women. Uh, my dad was president of the Rotary. He had run for city council twice. Mm -hmm. I remember walking precincts with my mom, working at the the headquarters for the party. Uh, I remember meeting Ronald Reagan when I was, gosh, 10 or 11. Uh, he was promoting a book called The Quotable Ronald Reagan. And he wrote, Best Wishes, Robert McCoy, Ronald Reagan, rubbed my head and gave it to me. Oh, man. He didn't realize back then that he was endorsing me today. but That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. But I, I, I was just moved by my parents' sacrifice. They, yeah. they served in their community. They saw the importance of politics. They were, they were uh, up to date on all the geopolitical issues. My father had uh, a couple of tours of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was a Navy captain. We were surrounded by... You know, Admiral James Stockdale in Coronado, uh, most decorated Vietnam veteran, was in the Hanoi Hilton, that had the Medal of Honor. Wow. Uh, he was the vice presidential running mate to Ross Perot, I think it is. Amazing people growing up in the community and a love for the nation. Mm -hmm. And my mom and dad had a love for the country. Then I became a Christian, and I couldn't understand why the church was not involved politically. Right. I couldn't process yeah. why they were just AWOL. Right. And, and it was almost an indoctrination that, you know, politics is dirty. The church doesn't do that. And right. I thought, well, the church is dirty. Right. And they go, well, you know, we, we, we don't, we're tired of voting for the lesser of two evils. 
well, unless Jesus is running for office, you're always voting for the Lord. Right, right. I, couldn't, I couldn't process all the excuses right. for the apathy. Right. So early on when I became a senior pastor, uh, I'd bring in candidates, I'd, I'd uh, endorse candidates, I'd, I'd send my, my sermon in to the IRS and say, come get me, because I believe the First Amendment. Right. I, I, I know the founders, I know the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution, the 27 amendments. I, I know why they gave us the First Amendment so that we could be the counselor to the right. sovereign, the king, which is the first three words of the preamble of the Constitution, we the people. Right. And so our founders said, look, the king needs a counselor and the president needs a cabinet. So we're gonna give him the pulpits. We're gonna give yeah. the people the pulpits so that the, the truth can be proclaimed. We're gonna give him the press so that the, the truth can be reported. We're gonna give him speech so they can declare truth. And then the right to peaceably assemble and, and it's the power of the logos, the spoken word, pursuing truth. And now we find ourselves, strangely enough, in the most censored moment of our lifetime. Right. And, and the censorship, I've never seen this. I'm 57 years old, I've never seen this. Wow. And, and, and censorship, the, the truth is never afraid of a lie. Right. But a lie can't survive in the presence of truth. So you have to, you have to suppress truth in order mm -hmm. to put forward the lie, the propaganda. Right. And that's what we're facing. Right. And they say well, it's science. But if you can't test it, it's not science. Right. Yeah. If you can't challenge it, yeah. it's not science. Exactly. So uh, all that to say, I could not stand idly by watching our state go down the tubes. And so I ran for office. Yeah. Um, and, and I got pushed back, just like you did. But you'll love this statistic. This will make sense to the folks that are listening. I'm a Calvary Chapel pastor. Right. Calvary Chapel started in California in 1967. Right. Chuck Smith, he was a yes. four-square pastor. He broke away from the four-square, started teaching the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Lonnie Frisbee came on. Right. Kind of, you know, bringing in syncopated rhythms and this new Maranatha music. Right. And first kind of mega church explosion happened in Costa Mesa. Right. And from that, in 1967, when Chuck started it, he looked out, he and his wife Kay, and they saw all these disillusioned young people, long hair, <laughs> and, and they, were, they were awash on the shores of California because they were burned out. Right. They had left the church. Right. They had checked into Eastern religion mm -hmm. and experimental drug usage, and they were burned out, and they were just awash on the shores of California. And Chuck looked at them, and so did Kay, and they reached out to them, but they avoided politics. And the reason why, because the church had always been involved in politics, but the last 50 years, they abdicated, walked away from it. Here's why. In 1967, you had Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who was shot on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Right. Bobby Kennedy was shot by Sirhan Sirhan in LA. In 63, you'd have JFK was shot. Right. You'd have the My Lai Massacre, the Tet Offensive, the Kent State shootings, all in 1967. The nation was being torn apart. Right. Young people were disillusioned and all their heroes are dead. And Chuck just realizes they're burned out. And all they need is the gospel. They need right, the word. Yeah, yeah. So he, he just teaches the Bible. He keeps the main thing, the plain thing, and the plain thing, the main thing, and avoids politics. It worked. Calvary Chapel had 10,000% growth since 1967. There's 1,800 Calvary Chapels around the world. South of Van Nuys, down to the Mexican border, there's more Calvary Chapels than there are Dunkin' Donuts. It's, it's a Calvary Chapel sandbox. Right. And the lion's share of those churches, and at one point, I think four of the 10 largest churches in America were Calvary chapels. In 1967, in California, we had the fifth largest GDP, gross domestic production. In 1967, we just completed the California aqueduct that was a marvel in engineering. Right. The most fertile farmland produces more cotton in the San Joaquin Valley than the entire South combined. Water comes out from the Sierras, waters it fertile. You know this, Redding. Add this to it, Reagan was governor. We were a conservative state, and now 1967 happens, Chuck starts Calvary Chapel, avoids politics. What happens? Well, we've had 10,000% growth, but how has the gospel changed the state? Right. Well, we no longer have the fifth largest GDP. We now have the sixth, maybe seventh. We have the highest gas tax, sales tax, income tax, corporate tax. We lead the nation in debt. You can buy the next four largest states debt, it doesn't equal the debt of California. We lead the nation in no-fault divorce that Reagan signed into law in 1969 that became law in 70. It, he regretted this and, and the, his whole life. His whole life. The other one was uh, not giving the um, 
uh, medical industry, they were exempt from liability with their vaccines, but we'll cover that later. So Reagan signs no-fault divorce, decimates a marriage across the country, were the authors of no-fault divorce, transgender bathroom bills, the most secular progressive sexual education curriculum ever. But here's the kicker. California leads the nation in abortion. It's been estimated that we've aborted more children in California than the entire uh, nation of Canada. But here's the worst part. We don't just we don't just eviscerate the baby in the womb of its mother and then flush its parts into the sewer system. No, no, we're far more evil. We harvest their organs while they're living, then shred their body and flush it into the sewer Jesus. system of our state. And I ask pastors, how did this come about? Where's the power of the gospel? Yeah. Our people wow. can't live here anymore. They can't afford to. Wow. Being a child in the womb in California is, is the most dangerous place you could be. Wow. Where's the power of the gospel? Yeah. God Come always on. intended us to be in politics. Right. If he didn't, why did he invent marriage? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's politics every day, yeah. right? <laughs> it's true. The idea is, as Aristotle said, politics <clears throat> is the highest form of community. It combines morality with sociability. How do we get along? Any pastor who operates a church knows politics. Mm -hmm. We contend for the welfare of our city. Pray for the peace of the city, for in its peace you'll have peace. And I'll leave you with this last part. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus brings his disciples up from Galilee. Mm -hmm. These Orthodox Jewish boys. They travel to the headwaters of the Jordan in Caesarea Philippi. Park-like setting, you've probably been there. It's resplendent. Mm -hmm. And every culture that's occupied that region has set up a temple to their god or goddess. So the cliffs are inundated with temples to all these pagan deities. And as they get up there, these Orthodox Jewish boys <clears throat> surrounding Jesus, their rabbi, and they hear this cacophony of pagan worship. Romans are up there occupying it. And Jesus turns to his disciples in the midst of it. And they're just captivated because they've never been that far north. And he says, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Jeremiah, John the Baptist. But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Hmm. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my, and everyone says church. That's not the word. Yeah. I think come till hundreds of years later, Jesus didn't use a religious term. He didn't say synagogue. He didn't say temple. He used a secular term that had been in usage in the Greek world mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. It's called Ecclesia or Ecclesia. Yeah. Actually, Tyndale translated it correctly in the first English-speaking Bible. And because he did, he was hung and his remains were burned. It's translated assembly, but better than that, in Greek culture, studying Greek culture, even looking at Aristotle, the Ecclesia or the Ecclesia was the city hall. Yeah. That's where people gathered for the welfare wow. of their city and the decisions to be made, trade, finance, all there. So now read the passage. Upon this rock, I'll build my city hall or my public square, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Gates and slave. Mm -hmm. Christ has come to set the captives free. How does he do that? Make disciples. Not converts? No. Disciples. Disciples of nations. What are nations? Boundaries, borders, constitutions, ideologies. One seeks to set free, the other seeks to enslave. This is, in the 6,000 years of recorded history, America is a nation designed, understanding the nature of man, sinful, checks and balance, three-part government, executive, legislative, judicial, holding man accountable, and giving a constitution with seven articles to protect the sovereign, the people, from the government itself. Yeah. Because power seeks to enslave. Yeah. And to do that, men need to know the truth, First Amendment. Yeah. We're in an unprecedented time where these inalienable rights, and that's the purpose of government, protect those inalienable rights. Unprecedented time in our history, we're about to lose that. Yeah. And the church must awaken to its responsibility. Come on. I, I, I think I'm so, I'm so interested in the history of what you're talking about with California because, you know, I've studied those revivals, the Jesus People yeah. Movement, <clears throat> Lonnie Frisbee stuff, Chuck Smith, all this. And I've, I've you know, been to... Um, Corona Del Mar, where yeah. everyone was baptized, and I have those pictures. The Life magazine, of, it's profound, you know, and all that stuff. And I, I, I'm one, like, and I, and I know so many people that got saved in that season across America, and but yet this sustaining change 
this the reformation component right so you have the revival you have people getting saved but then you have the the reformation you know not converts disciples people that are going to change culture and culture yep. won't change them what do you feel like are the components like cuz i believe that there's a jesus people movement coming a new one that it's something fresh is happening you know we're sitting here on the first day of 2022 and we're starting to see it across america it's powerful i mean what god is doing what we experienced last night you know 100 40, 150 something cities. What are the components as we learn from history, you know, especially in California, how do we have to see this foundation of, of revival, what God's doing? How does it need to be different? Where can we, like, we want to do the worship, we want to do the right, we want to do all that stuff, just like they did in the Jesus people movement, but we cannot find ourselves back here again after this next move what guys what give me your thoughts about that what what do we need to focus on or what needs to be different than was then that's a great question <clears throat> one i pondered isaiah 9 and we're just coming out of the christmas season unto us a child is born unto us a son is given mm -hmm. and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty, mighty god, god everlasting, everlasting father, father yeah. prince of peace Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of Christ in the midst of the conflict. Mm -hmm. I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword, the Lord said. Mm -hmm. We're contending with ideology. People aren't the enemy, they're the opportunity. The ideology they hold is the enemy. Yeah. We must contend for truth. We want to be liked. Pastors mm -hmm. want to be peaceable. And we think that peace is the absence of conflict. So when we're just minding our own business, and the governor then says we're non-essential and to shut us down. Right. We have to make a decision. Do yeah. we kneel to tyranny or do we stand in defense of the bride? And <clears throat> compromise is, is one of those things in this season that the church cannot be a part of. Right. Because right now there's an attempt to usurp all of the freedoms right. of our neighbors. And if we love our neighbors, we'll contend for their freedom. What does a government on his shoulder look like? It's fascinating because a government of God is freedom. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to enslave. Mm -hmm. He enslaves us by our own sin nature, and he, he, he enslaves us by wanting to perpetrate on others that which was done to us. Mm -hmm. And we just become instruments of evil right. until we destroy that which was created in the image of God, which was meant to flourish. Yeah. So there's two types of law. <clears throat> One, and, and this is the moral law, comes civil law. The law, Galatians 3, is a school teacher, guardian, to point us to Christ until faith comes. So if we apply good moral law and civil law, <clears throat> our society flourishes and our people do well because the law is the wise restraints that make men free. You apply restraints towards evil in order to pursue excellence. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's ever done athletics understands this. While most kids are sleeping in or playing some sort of video game in the basement, you know, the, the kids who are standing on the block at the Olympics getting the gold medal were up at four o'clock in the morning, right. two hours of practice, yeah. two hours in the afternoon. They know what it's like because they front loaded their life and they applied restraint right. in order to pursue excellence. Right. They get to enjoy that sport at a level of excellence most people will never be able to enjoy. God gives us that ability to excel. Right. <clears throat> we want to raise our kids that way. That's why we front load them. Right. Now, the wise restraints that make us free, the law can also be weaponized to enslave. Right. That's the difference of the government on his shoulder. He's come to set captives free. Right. Free from ourselves in right. order to serve others and set them free. Yeah. They'll know the truth. What's the truth? The laws of nature, nature is right. God. Right. It's all revealed. Our founders were brilliant. They understood the nature of man and the sin nature. What they put together was unprecedented, but it can only survive with a moral people. And if the church doesn't understand its responsibility, we'll become irrelevant. Yeah. We're just TED Talks with music. Right. So you want to know what the answer yes. is? Dust off the old books. <clears throat> start to understand your role in the ecclesia. Yeah. Guide the people to the truth right. that these wise restraints would make them free. That's our job. That is good our job. Good government happens with good people. And if good people do not participate, I'll leave you with this. <clears throat> morality and character. Morality is not doing what's wrong. Yeah. 
character is doing what's right. So your child comes home from school and says, Mommy, Daddy, all the kids in the school called Susie fat, but I didn't. You know, that's a moral thing to do, child, but where's your character? They say, what do you mean? Why didn't you tell the other children to stop it? Right. That's character. All that's necessary for evil to prosper is for good men and women to do nothing. nothing. God wants us to do something. Yeah. Sean, that's why I am so blessed by you. <laughs> you. You didn't stand idly by. Yeah. You took the slings and the arrows, but you stood because you understood the bride is essential. Yeah. Worship is essential. Nobody, there's no tyrant on the face of the earth that will ever, ever separate God's people yeah. from, from honoring and serving Him. Yeah. Ever. Come on. No man has that right. Come and on. And no man ever will. Yeah. Now, they can enslave you and they can threaten you and they can... Mm -hmm. But really, you know what? The only weapon they possess is fear. Right. And just like the Apostle Paul, put me in prison. Yeah. I don't care. Right. This is my new duty station. Totally. Yeah. Chain me to two Roman guards. <laughs> Great converts. Right. Captive audience. Totally. Totally. When we have surrendered everything, fear no longer right. is a totally. weapon to yeah. be used against us. Yeah. I watch that in you and it blesses me more than you know. Wow. Wow. I, I, I just, you know, being in, being in California and, you know, leading your church and running for office and kind of modeling what that looks like, what are some of the, like, how did you keep, how do you keep Jesus the focus, building his kingdom the focus, and how do you deal with the political vitriol, especially in our state, the insanity, right? Everything that you said, you know, about <clears throat> California, the history and where it's gone, where it is now. I do believe it can turn around. I, you know, <laughs> it's funny when I was doing the podcast, the last podcast with Rick Scott, he was trolling me that I still live in California and I'm not in Florida, which we get that stuff all the time, all you the know. Time. But... <clears throat> It's a state worth contending for, Amen. you know, and there's gold in the golden state. And, and, God's and not I, done with it yet. He's not done with it yet. But how do you avoid, like, how do you keep people, and this is something I'm, I'm asking selfishly for myself, but I, I feel like other people ought to be a blessing to them. How do you stay out of the vitriol, but yet engage culturally, but yet keep your eyes on Jesus? Like, what are some tips you can give people as they wade through the waters? We're about to head into a, a year with the midterms. It's going to be insane. The political ads start yesterday. Yeah. Um, when I ran for office, the rule was, treat my opponent like she's my wife because it was a female. I don't want any ugly pictures of her. I run against issues. Right. People are not the enemy, they're the opportunity. Right. Treat them with respect. Uh, a gift opens up the way for the giver. Love them. I bring honey to the other council members, secular progressive, absolutely opposed to my positions. Right. And one in particular, her name is uh, Claudia Bilde La Pena. Secular progressive, Democrat. Um, she's running for supervisor and she's like, all into the secular progressive movement, the vaccines, the whole bit. She asked me to come when the, when uh, Trump was president and she was the mayor at the time. Trump was president and he had done this immigration declaration, a presidential decree, and they were protesting out in front of the mosque and she asked me to attend and the other council members. Now, she's the mayor. I'm a man under authority. Right. Honor those in positions of authority. All things are permissible, not all things are profitable. She asked the council to come out, which was a little beyond her reach, but she asked. I honored her as the mayor. I said, Claudia, it's on a Sunday. I've got three services, but let me see what I can do. I finished the three services and I came. When I got there, it was packed and I had to walk uh, from the shopping center over to the mosque and I had to cross the street and I saw the signs and they were detestable to me and they were in opposition to my political views. And and I'm looking and everyone across the street is everyone that didn't vote for me and probably hates me. <laughs> and I, I remember standing there and I called my wife and I, she didn't answer, but I was calling to say goodbye, you know. Uh, honey, I miss you. But I, I, I said a prayer. I said, Lord, would you bring me a friend? Cause I'm a little nervous. Yeah. And to my right was this man dressed in Muslim gear. And his name was Samir. And I go, hey, I'm uh, nice to meet you. I'm Rob. He says, I'm Samir. He says, thank you for coming today. Let me introduce you to the Imams. And we cross the street. And yeah. it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. Who is he? Why is he? How's he with him? Why? Right. And we meet the Imams and they say hello. And we come back and Claudia sees me and she runs up and there's tears in her eyes. She says, I never thought you'd come. I said, Claudia, you invited me. She said, no one else came. Wow. I said, well, I'm here. 
And she put the badge on me and Samir looks at it and it says Rob McCoy. And he goes, you're Rob McCoy. I go, yeah, Samir. Hopefully I'm not who you think I was because you're not who I thought you were. I asked God for a friend, he gave me you. Wow. And it was touching. Wow. And when I stood in front and each of the speakers, all Democrat. Mm -hmm. Oh, one in particular, uh, this man had come after us. He was part of this um, progressive movement, a, a Soros funded organization where they mm -hmm. were targeting Christians. And I was yeah. in his, his hair, uh, crosshairs. His name is Cummings, Michael Cummings. The article said we're targeting Rob McCoy. And that was a Sunday paper. So I, this was a heavy day. So all of a sudden, um, Claudia says, Rob, I want you to meet someone. And introduced me to this Cummings guy. And I look at him, I said, I came today so it'd be easier to monitor me. And he, he uncomfortably giggled, I gave him a hug. And then I stood in the front as each of the speakers spoke and every one of them changed their tone and their tenure right. because they were respectful. Right. They knew I cared right. and they honored that except for him. And he came off so shrill that it distanced him from the people that once supported him. Right. We're building community. You have to step into the middle of it. Right. A missionary goes where he's not loved but needed and leaves when he's no longer needed but loved. Right. That's powerful. That is powerful. Running for office makes you a better pastor. Because yeah. <laughs> you realize how stupid you sound behind the pulpit to the people out there that are just trying to figure out life. Wow. And then you understand the needs of the city and now you can intercede in a greater capacity. Right, right, totally. Yeah, I, I, I really believe, and, and, and it's our hearts, even what we're, what we're here today in Miami, is that we can empower people with practical tools to be able to engage. You know, and I think there's a lot of people that want to engage and it's like, we're, we're not just talking about like, hey, go to a Trump rally and like a rah-rah. Like that's, pillow. yeah, yeah, that, that's <laughs> not, that, that to me, I, I feel like, and it, you know, it, we have to actually, like that's cheap to do that stuff. Like we have to actually get people <clears throat> that are gonna put skin in the game. Well, what's your advice to people? How, where can they start? in the closing here. How can they engage? Real simple. This, this is a game changer. And we're, we're implementing it I'm with Charlie Kirk at Turning Point Faith, and we're doing it with churches across the country. Dear friend of mine, David Barton, and his buddy and my dear friend, Rick Green, put together a biblical citizenship class that we hosted for eight weeks in our church. Wow. You would think attendance would shrink. It exploded. Wow. And the people that came would never darken the doors of our church. They came because they wanted to understand America because they love America. Their streams of liberty have dried up. Mm -hmm. And so they came to the source. Yeah. With 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Right. And they come and we walk them through the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the 27 Amendments, the Bill of Rights. We walk through them all. We give them a history and an understanding of this nation and, this, and the significance of it. And when they leave, they become the mama bears who are now sitting at the school board meetings. Wow. They're now running for office. It's a game changer. Wow. If everyone in America would dust off the old books, and the Lord says this all the time, remember, remember, the longest running family meal in world history is the Passover. Yeah. And it's to remember that you were once slaves and you're now free. Right. The Lord wants you to remember who you are. You're an American conceived in liberty and dedicate the proposition that all men are created equal and these rights are inalienable. No one can take them. Wow. They're always there. Yeah. And they're like muscles. If you don't use them, you'll lose them. Yeah. Defend them for generations to come. Serve the generations to come. You've been given 245 years of unprecedented freedom. If you ride in an elevator, it was invented by an American. If you fly in an airplane, it was invented by an American. If you enjoy air conditioning, it was invented <laughs> by an American. Because we've had unprecedented freedom it's time to extend that to our children and our grandchildren. Come on. And the church must do that. Remember who you are, a nation that has a system of government that understands the nature of man and gives freedom to speech and religion to proclaim truth. If the most important thing is preaching the gospel, the second most important thing is protecting the government that protects the preaching of that gospel. Yeah. 86 cents of every dollar in evangelism comes from the United States of America. 
You bind the strong man, you'll plunder his house. America cannot fall. Yeah. We must. We must. Come on. Dust off the old books and look at this constitutional republic and defend it. Come on. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, God bless you guys. <clears throat> Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for letting me talk on and on and this on. This is so good. This is so good. 2022 is going to be an amazing Amen. year. We're going to take back America. We're going to engage. It's going to be powerful. God bless you guys.